I have been blessed with a voice that is <clears throat> even to me breathtakingly beautiful. <clears throat> uh, that's total immodesty. I do not apologize for that. I don't know of anything, not even myself, that I love more than my sound. <laughs> The beauty of her phrasing and the coloration of her sound are nothing less than a musical marvel. When she sang Aida for the first time with Herbert von Karajan, she said, I use notes I didn't even know I had when I sang that performance. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when she sings with me, I hear notes I never even knew existed before. Leontine Price, you are probably the most celebrated singer of our time and perhaps uh, of all time and the degrees and the honors keep rolling in, the stature uh, keeps growing. You now have uh, degrees from Columbia, Harvard and Yale and I don't think anybody in the world could hope for more than that. What do you feel about all this? I mean, what, what goes through your mind as all this keeps happening to you? Rather overwhelmed, extremely humble. Um, um, very anxious to at least continue as much as I can for as long as I can to at least earn, to continue to earn the esteem or the respect of one's peers and uh, distinguished um, academic ambiances like um, Harvard and Columbia and, uh, and Yale. It's, it's, it's an extreme, you know, the Kennedy, it, 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 it really, uh, I think it's a great source of inspiration. It, it makes me feel so young <laughs> and <laughs> vibrant. You're, you're truly an Ivy League diva now. Uh, is well, it <laughs> thank you, Robert. That's beautiful. <laughs> is it a scary feeling uh, to suddenly have reached that kind of plateau, uh, the accessibility or the you know, kind of high standing that you have? I never think of that, Robert, because that in, in, uh, mentally or uh, psychologically sets up a, a feeling of, of, shall we say, um, uh, immobility. It's better not to linger on that, to, to try to maybe extend oneself uh, beyond the last, shall we say, accolade. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just to take it in your stride and live with it. Well, try and, to be. And be natural you, with it. If you can, yes. Mm -hmm. I want to go way back because uh, <clears throat> we want to review many things in your life and I want to go very far back to the beginnings to Laurel, Mississippi. Tell me a little bit about the atmosphere in which you grew up in Laurel. Well, it was an atmosphere, I think I had one of the happiest childhoods that I, that uh, of anyone I could possibly think of. It was full of love, a great deal of inspiration, discipline, uh, community spirit, extraordinary parents who, uh, who are responsible even to this day by spirit and by the planting of, of shall we say, certain types of roots responsible for all of the, of the wonderful honors that you uh, mentioned before. Um, the physical setup, I think, of all southern towns are sort of what you call up and down, and everyone meets in the middle of town, which is the main shopping area, etc. In uh, particularly in, in black southern communities, the church itself is the social, as, a, as in all provincial areas, uh, that the church itself and the school are, are remain sort of the, the, the places for social gatherings, religious gatherings. In other words, everything is planned it is the sort of townhouse, it's the meeting place, it's the uh, disciplinary ambiance of, for everything. And between these two units, um, characters and careers and people are developed, but with great love and care and a community care. In other words, I feel that there were many teachers and neighbors that helped to do as much for my upbringing which is a southern and provincial custom as my parents or my own relatives. And it, it, it sort of makes them makes a strong character for, for branching out, you know, in the world. And it was a very positive atmosphere. Ex that's then. what I'm trying to say. Very focused and very positive, but with a great deal of love and a feeling of, of security, you know. Now, t your father was a carpenter, yes? My father was a carpenter and a sawmill worker. The carpentry was done to bring in extra uh, funds. He was very skillful with his hands. As a matter of fact, he was 
uh, I think a great electrician because he could he could do any repair work. He did all the community repair repair work for electricity, um, uh, without have, ever have had any mechanical training at all. And my mother, of course, is uh, was a, a prima donna in her own right because I I think she delivered more babies in Jones County than any midwife alive at that particular time. Um, also kept a very fine home. Never we never we never. Um, what shall we say, were a miss for tender love and care and uh, warmth and um, I don't think I knew I was poor until recently <laughs> <laughs> when I was a child. It was that wonderful. You mean, yes. Until you began to think about it. Until you began to think about it. <laughs> oh, well, it's, it, 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 shall we say, became, it was, it's in. <laughs> and yeah. you, had a, uh, you have a brother. I have a brother who is the youngest of the two of us. There are two of us who is a re recently retired Brigadier General in the United States Army. You were very active uh, in musical things in Laurel, although you weren't singing per se. I mean, you weren't thinking about singing uh, as a career at that time. No. Uh, actually, <clears throat> I hold a bachelor's degree in, it, in music education uh, so that I could uh, teach public school music if anything uh, goes wrong. <laughs> uh, I actually started playing the piano, I think, around the age of six, or rather studying the piano around the age of six with a wonderful lady called uh, Hattie V.J. McKinnis, who was also on the faculty of Oak Park High School. And uh, I, I, I played for all the chapel services in school and for the general uh, morning march in, for the Sunday school, for all of the social activities. I was general girl about Friday at the piano. And then later, I was quote unquote discovered to have uh, a vocal apparatus of some distinction, but that did not come until later, about my sophomore year in college as a matter of fact, and then I was urged to pursue a singing career, not necessarily operatic, but a singing career around my sophomore year in college. But listen, <clears throat> when you were graduating uh, or nearing graduation from high school, what was your aspiration at that point? When the the shall we say, from as poor a background, I mean by that not, a, not available a great deal of financial um, uh, finances available. Usually, if the youngsters are fortunate enough to have parents who want to sacrifice, as my parents did, you actually go to college with the idea to try to make a living sort of, shall we say, bring something back into the community. So the gambling on something as esoteric as an operatic career or a concert career was not formed at that time. Actually, the idea was to have an education, to receive a teacher's degree, so that one could make a life for oneself and also help the person behind you. Um, I was fortunate because I was able to, to extend that uh, idea, but the, the main idea is with that, it's because everyone has to sacrifice for one person to, to be able to be educated. So you never waste time. It really is something very serious. I'm, I'm happy to say that in, in most of the institutions in the South, even so, this, 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 this very fervent desire to achieve and succeed and receive the degree uh, it's a very serious attitude that it's planted early with the youngsters in the home. So it's a very serious business, you and, know. And a, and a practical application. There was no sort of fantasia going None. on. None. I mean, you, 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 you must do it, you know. I mean, it's something that brings out the best in you. And it really has, that type of training and that type of mental attitude is a good mainstay for, for things that happen to you later. It certainly has been for me. Was there an awareness of, <clears throat> of opera at that point? I mean, were you thinking at all about opera? Did you like the opera? Had you heard much opera, at least on the radio? Or? Yes, the Metropolitan Opera broadcasts. I think this probably is said by any youngster since the year one. I would be able, do, doing part-time jobs, if there was a radio around, I would uh, sneak in and listen to the, to the broadcasts. And when I was finally able to come to Juilliard, which was 19, the season 1948-49, after I graduated from college. I remember one performance on the radio, the Metropolitan Opera House, from the Opera House of Zalame. And I was able that first year as a student at Juilliard to receive a standee, to get a standee ticket 
to see Luba Village in Zalame, and I was uh, slightly hooked at that moment. <clears throat> if that didn't do it, nothing would. Absolutely. <laughs> but I was wondering if you were listening to the radio, and let's say you were hearing a great Verdi opera sung by Milanov, and you said, oh God, if only I could be Milanov up on that stage. Did that ever cross your mind? No, I've never thought that at all. As a matter of fact, I would say that my inspiration came as far as the bravura of, 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 of performing, the performing disease itself to catch. I received from Marian Anderson, who still uh, is my great inspiration. I didn't even know who Milanoff was at that time, no. You were, so you were a little bit of an innocent before going off to Wilberforce uh, College. Central State Central College State, so at, at Wilberforce. Wilberforce yeah. Uh, I still am in many ways. It's, it's very good. <laughs> I want to know how they discovered you had a voice. I mean, what, what happened? Did, did you just sing a solo in a, in a choral concert, or what happened that they discovered this voice? Actually, it's rather the story of my life, fortunately, meaning nothing negative by it. I've done wonders by people who had to cancel at the last minute or received uh, emergency appendectomies or et cetera, et cetera. Um, it began in my, I would say, my sophomore year at college. I played for also for a number of things with the chorus and with the glee club. And one of the main soloists had to cancel at one time, and I pinch hit it not only at the piano but also sang something for her. And at that particular time, uh, visiting as an artist on the campus after having performed uh, in recital was Todd Duncan. And I was able to audition for him at that particular time in the home of President Wesley, the president of Central State College at that time. And he encouraged me to pursue a musical, you know, vocal career. But until then, I had not taken it seriously at all. But he told you you had the potential for it. He in intimated that uh, I might have some potential, yes. And what was the voice like then? How could you describe? It was actually a mezzo. Mezzo? Now, th this sounds strange, but that's true. A dear friend of mine who right now, uh, actually recently, has taken over the helm at the um, Harlem School for the Arts, Betty Allen, was not only a roommate of mine in college, but also sang all of the soprano parts in the Messiah, and I, au contraire, sang the contralto part. Oh, I'm amazed to hear that. <laughs> but it's true, <laughs> yes, yes. And then did the teacher at, um, in Ohio begin to work the voice up? Actually, I started technically vocal training at Juilliard at proper. Uh -huh. um, I could shift gears between the soprano repertoire and the mezzo repertoire, but I had an enormous bottom and middle, so I, I, I was doing an awful lot of, um, of, of lower things, you know, or doing duets where the soprano was in one place, you know, the, the mm. usual. And then when I came to Juilliard to audition, there to be accepted. I was accepted, thank God, by Florence Page Kimball, who was my, my one and only um, vocal mentor and teacher for yes, all that's these years. something yeah. I definitely want to talk yeah. about. But when, <clears throat> when you suddenly discovered you had this <clears throat> voice and uh, you had it in your mind you were going to become a teacher, was it sort of a shock about well, what do I do now and did it sort of begin to change the course of your life and your thinking? With exposure that happened during the last part of the sophomore year in college, my junior year and my senior year, by that time, I had gathered in my own psychic what I think is um, a positive thing and sometimes uh, an overbearing thing for probably for operatic managers, <laughs> and that is uh, an ego, uh, total confidence in my own vocal prowess and raring to get cracking at a vocal career. It comes instinctively somehow from a certain type of exposure and then there's a confidence which, which comes, I think, from beginning to love your own sound, which I still have in abundance. And the next thing you know, you, 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 you have this, this desire to, to, to sing, to, to, to sing it to people. And that's how it happened to me, a very natural. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Central State. Was it hard, you came from a small community, very close-knit, was it hard to go away to school? Was there a lot of adjustment uh, to be made at that time? I was so anxious to go and so uh, thrilled to be fortunate enough to go that the excitement um, cuts down on, on the change of the ambiance, you know, of the, of the, of, of the initial fright of a, of a young person going from, from 
a provincial area into sort of uh, branching out into the academic world, shall we say. And, and actually all college communities are a bit in, you know, in, indoors anyway. So it, 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 after a while, it, it, it's, it's sort of the same thing. You, you find your way about and uh, find uh, new friends and sort of make your own little niche. And it works out beautifully. You know. And you became active in uh, a lot of musical things. Almost right immediately, because uh, with the applications, you see, you, you, you have these things to say that what you would like to be your potential endeavor. Um, the background, the musical background, as a Juilliard, um, was exceptional. Uh, harmony, the exposure. I would have liked to have had more exposure to languages in that particular time. Uh, but um, to a limited extent, there was a great deal of musical background en general, you know, which goes with the education that's needed for teaching in public school music or in high school or wherever you would. Um, so the, the background was very solid for later uh, the, the, the piano lessons, all of the things like that, that, that hold you in, in good stead uh, when you when you come later, that you can learn your own music, that you are not you're a bit more self sufficient in many ways. I found after I came to Juilliard, you see, so it was very mm -hmm. useful. What made you decide to go to the Juilliard? Mrs. Anna M. Terry, who was the head of the music department at that time. As a matter of fact, I see her very often when I sing in Boston. Uh, she's a very dear. Re uh, wrote for an application in Juilliard because a friend of hers had been a graduate there and recommended it highly as <clears throat> the conservatory to, to go with. And I was accepted and that, that, was, uh, that was about the size you applied of for it. a scholarship, didn't I you? I applied for a scholarship, yes. And you received full? I received, I received no, no, just uh, part-time. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. At this juncture, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the influence of the Chisholms uh, Fine, I'd uh, love that. On you, because I think they were very helpful uh, in your going to school. My parents were the source, spiritually, emotionally, and financially, for my brother and I for college. Since my senior, my graduating year in college was my brother's first year in college, that is presented a very great problem because I wanted to pursue a graduate, a graduate career or at least to try to go to the conservatory of Juilliard. That was very difficult for me, almost I would say impossible since my brother was beginning his freshman year in college and it was that, at that time that they offered to help send me to Juilliard to pursue an extended career uh, and my parents agreed. And I quite respect them because they did ask them if that was all right to do, um, which is one of the main um, wonderful qualities between the two families. The friendship is a very special one, one um, that I think made the papers once because of certain areas that were obvious about it, obviously make an awful lot of news um, worthy um, exposure. But basically, the friendship still exists between the two families because it was founded on a great deal of respect and affection mm -hmm. for each other. So they financed my entering into Juilliard. I also helped myself, which is, um, um, comes with the territory of being a price, I think, mm -hmm. by working in, at Riverside Church, in, in choirs, in the Unitarian Church in Montclair. In other words, I worked part-time at the International House, I worked part-time for different church jobs, and I was able to sort of at least help myself. But basically they, they, they were able to take care of the, the main expenses for my uh, being in Juilliard for the first two or three years. Can you tell me a little bit about the family itself? Are they a prominent family of the Laurel? Yes, uh, the, one of the most prominent in the southern area of, <clears throat> of um, probably the, the most prominent in Mississippi, I would say, the southeast area of the country. Um, the, the mainstay, I think, of that particular community for employment for in, in that area would probably, I think, if I'm, I'm correct, would be their lumber um, 
company and the Masonite Corporation, which I'm sure you've heard of. It's a, it's a type of a, of a fabric that is used in building homes and buildings. And those two units uh, were, are the, still the source, great source of, uh, of income for everyone in, in that particular community, which was in their family. Do you still have a good relationship with that family today? I just said it. Yeah, you do. Yes, yes. My, one of my best friends is uh, Peggy Chisholm. We see each other all the time. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, now, the Juilliard experience, you, how many years were you at the Juilliard? Three and a half. Um, thunderstruck about the, the second part of the fourth year because the, the Virgil Thompson Company was trying to, in, to revive the third production of The Four Saints in Three Acts. And my dear friend Martha Flowers, who we at Juilliard together, would sneak out sometimes between classes and audition on Broadway, as a matter of fact. I used to audition. We used to audition for all sorts of Broadway shows as well. And we were tapped on the shoulder after singing a few phrases for Virgil Thompson and given the parts of Saint 26 or 27, I don't know. And uh, that was a type of major exposure. He was taking the company at that time, after a limited run on Broadway, to perform for the Congress of Cultural Freedom, which was run by Nicholas Nabokov, a different at that time, to Paris. At the same time, Blevins Davis and Robert Breen were forming the third revival of Porgy and Bess. So we auditioned for that as well. I was extremely lucky because in one week, I received the contract to go for the Four Saints and Three Acts and a contract to do best, to alternate uh, best with your Lee Leonardus for the Blevins Davis Company. So from then on, it was just uh, a matter of, just uh, of, of, of really taking off. And before that, you had done Alice Ford, as I recall, in Falstaff. That's, that's, that, is, that actually, I, I didn't mean to, de to deliberately forget that. You, thank you for reminding me. Was where Virgil Thompson heard me in Major Exposure at this wonderful opera theater, which, which was existing at Juilliard and still does at that time. And that's where I sang Mistress Ford. And uh, that's also in the audience was at that time Blevins Davis and Robert Breen. So they all three units were sort of after me at that so time. So they were aware that you existed already at that, at that point. That's right, because as it still exists now, the major critics always came to those student performances. And I don't mean to sound chauvinistically uh, Julia Dietish, but <laughs> they were really wonderful, wonderful performances in the best possible uh, professional air. And um, they would write, they would write, write criticisms and would also point out those artists that they thought might have some potential. And fortunately, I was one of those for that particular year. I think the year was 1952. Yes. What I was curious about was, uh, did Virgil Thompson give you a good review for Falstaff? Yes, he did. As a matter of fact, I remember very, very, very um, vividly um, some remarks he made. He was a very good friend of my teacher's, <clears throat> Miss Kimball. They knew each other very well, and he had some very encouraging things to say, also some objective suggestions. And time by time, uh, she used to give little soirees where uh, uh, promising students could do some type of singing for very important people, and I had the opportunity to do that for him several times. And he's a dear friend, as a matter of fact, all these years, and I, I, I treasure the objectivity that I received from him, not only as a friend, but as a critic earlier. Yes, because he was a brilliant. And Roland Downs, you know, those, those, the, the, there was always something uh, for potential artists to build on. I think that really is the job of a critic in many ways as far as young artists are concerned. So they were very <laughs> encouraging to these Julia students. Most encouraging, yes. Do you remember any uh, particular experiences of working with Virgil Thompson during uh, Four Saints? I received a solo part quicker than I thought. I was brought out of the, um, the sort of um, chorus lineup of saints, shall we say, and asked to do one or two high notes for um, um, someone. And um, um, that sort of made, gave me, from an equity point of view, a, prof a different type of contract. <laughs> I remember that. Yes. Do you consider Four Saints a, a breakthrough period for you? Or was that the work that sort of began to put you on the map? 
that was really the first very major exposure. Mm -hmm. Also, that's, that's what makes you a professional because then you have to be for that kind of touring, you know, uh, and to, to perform in the, in the theaters. You have to become a member of equity, so that sort of strips you of all non-professional, uh, shall we say, um, freebies. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, and you said goodbye to the student days. That, that's not really goodbye, but just a little au, au revoir, yes. <laughs> and you were singing every night then, too, because it was a kind it of was, a run, it was it? It was a run, yes, uh, for quite a little while. And mm -hmm. there's nothing better, I think, to season someone than suddenly that you have to be on stage and do something every I, night. Yes, I think that those earlier days were, were great. Uh, that was great experience for, uh, for an operatic career because it, 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 it teaches you pacing. I don't know anything that taught me pacing in opera better than my days and years and nights in Pog and Beth. Yes. Absolutely. That is something I definitely want to talk about because, of course, that's a major chapter in the history of that opera in this country was that long, was it two and a half years? Yes, two and a half years. About two for me. And I left it in the Midwest because um, not only had I had enough, but I was one of those rare American artists who had received enough interest from a monopoly like Columbia Artists that was under the, man the, the presidency of Andre Mertens at that time, who thought I had enough potential to receive a contract to start a recital career and a concert career with Columbia Artists. So that was the beginning of, shall we say, the really um, important part of the career that led to opera. So you were plucked out of uh, Porgy and Bess at that point. You probably had had enough after two and a half years? Oh, well, I, I really had. I wanted to get on with something else, yes. Did you do more than Bess? Uh, did you alternate in any other parts? Oh, no, I think Bess is enough. Yes, yes. No, I was wondering if you had done Serena or any other of the roles. No, but I, learning all the music, of course, because I do perform those uh, different... Uh, Bess is rather, was rather a, more a histrionic part, as a matter of fact, like Zalame, or um, I think in that sense, um, the most beautiful music in the best tessitura belonged to Serena and to, and to Clara, as a matter of fact. Uh, but Bess was a very acting, very, very, very vivid character from a histrionic point of view. That must have taken a lot out of you to do it so many nights a no. week. No. Youth <laughs> solves everything. Youth prevailed. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, yes. Was there a danger, Lantine, in becoming almost too associated with Bess at one time? I mean, after all, two and a half years is a long time. You were all around the country. You went to Europe, mm -hmm. to Russia. No, I didn't. You I didn't do, you, you didn't do the Russia, Russia, but yes. the European tour you did. Exactly. And you became very much associated with that part. I mean, that was a long time. Do you think it was a little dangerous? No, I think it's a wonderful vehicle, as it has been for many young artists. Uh, the problem is that you should know when it's time to move on to the next dimension. I rather like that because it, it, it uh, I, I, I think of, 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 of Pogue and Bess as an opera, you see. So I think of it as sort of my training ground, so it doesn't bother me at all. Except when what I have done in the next dimension is sort of uh, not taken into consideration along with that past experience, then I may get a little testy. Yes. But if they are both given this, the, the, the proper spotlight, I think, it's a, I think it, it, you can point to it with great pride because it's great music and the experience for any artist that has this experience in it early for her career or his career will be the better for it later. It's interesting, you made a very good point that you have always <clears throat> considered it an opera because yeah. when that piece was being done earlier on, people didn't know what to make of it. They were trying to say it's a musical comedy, it's musical yes. theater, but really it is an opera, isn't it? Yes, it's rather like, I think, the music of Sondheim today. I don't think it's totally just, um, you know, can, I don't think it can be categorized. I think there are many bravura moments that could make some of the things very operatic. They are very operatic in scope, very vocal, very, very wonderful to sing. Yes, well, I think finally mm -hmm. today in the later revivals, again, it has been taken seriously as an opera. But Indeed for, it is. But for many years, no. it was a real problem piece. No, it's very true. I think it beca it's because um, of Gershwin's involvement very much into the pure jazz medium. Uh, and I think it was the, the, more or less the mental, mental approach of people as uh, not giving him his image a chance uh, as a composer to, to think that he would be, you know, that, shall we say, wonderful in, in, in operatic uh, composing. Serious a composer, you mean? That, but I, right? I disagree, as, and he's been proven right. 
it really well, is. And your belief in the opera certainly has been proven too now. I mean, as we, in, in the 1980s, we accept it as a great masterpiece. Well, it is, and, and it's always fun to sing. Mm -hmm. It really is. Now, you mentioned about being taken up by Columbia artists as a recitalist, and I know you sang thousands of performances of the Beethoven Ninth, but... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you, were, you and Maureen Forrester, I think, were very famous about traveling, doing... Uh, yes, on this side of the, of the ocean, Maureen Forrester, God bless her, and Brava on this side, and Krista Ludwig and myself on the <laughs> other side, the Bobsy twins of the Beethoven Ninth. You know. That's also a good experience, though, particularly for a lyric soprano. And Excellent uh, experience. And working with a lot of major conductors. Incredible. Too. I mean, uh, what? let me see if I can even begin the list. Um, uh, it was my first, I think, one of my first per performances of the Bay of was Charles Munch in the Boston Symphony as a, 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 a sort of another time that I was sort of picked, plucked out at um, Tanglewood as a, having potential. Uh, with Herbert von Karajan when the Berlin Philharmonic came to uh, to Carnegie Hall. Goodness gracious, I, I, so many times I've done that, I think, in my early, early part of the career. It was a wonderful sort of calling card then for you. Exactly. And it also gives you this feeling of, of being in um, the best company and also um, uh, hearing, you know, getting used to the sound of big orchestras, you know, that can be very disarming for a young, uh, young artist because uh, it's sort of, it's, it's, a, it's a delving in and, and a congealing of, of what real professionalism is on stage, you know, to have a whole, the whole uh, massive thing with the orchestra, with the chorus, with the conductor, to, to give you a whole, um, shall we say, circle of how it really, it's, it sort of prepares you for the heavy battles ahead, so that when you do get into opera, you are, you are more or less used, not overwhelmed, shall we say, by the entire structure. And not terrified by that. I think terrified is probably the better <laughs> word, yes. Thunderbolt of sound coming <laughs> from behind yes. you. <laughs> exactly. So that was good experience for that, you know. But also in 1954, you made a rather astonishing debut. It was a recital debut at Town Hall, and uh, you had no less than Samuel Barber at the piano. You were doing new music. Yes, that sort of was the launching of me as, as uh, the contemporary composers, one of the contemporary composers, Girl Friday. I was fortunate in that because in my music teacher, my vocal teacher salon there were princes, princes of uh, contemporary um, art form. Henri Soguet, Poulenc, Samuel Barber, Virgil Thompson, Nicholas Nabokov, um, Riet, I, you name it, I, I had, I had a, 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 a Henri Soguet, I think I mentioned, and I was able to be exposed to that literature, which is literature that are mainstays on my recitals these days. It's, it's, it's wonderful, really. That friendship with Samuel Barber was one of the most, and still remains one of the most precious in my life, because if the chemistry, it's like in things in life, it, it went immediately. Did it begin with this recital? That's exactly right. Uh, and it was your teacher who put you together? That's right. Oh, marvelous. And you introduced uh, the hermit songs? I introduced songs. his hermit songs, which were done first and commissioned by, if I'm not mistaken, by Dunbar and Oaks at, no, I think the year was 1953, if I'm not mistaken. And we were invited to sing in Rome also doing a performance for a performance with the Congress for Cultural Freedom with Nabokov, where we did it at the Sancho Cecilia. Then I convinced him and Miss Kimball, with her esteemed help, to join me to do it in the second half of my town hall debut in 1954. So with trembling, petrified hands, Sam agreed to do so. And it was the major exposure in New York for that particular cycle. And our friendship bloomed ever so. I don't think since then there has ever been a performance of a recital of man that there has not been included some uh, com composition of Samuel Barber. Well, it always seemed to me that either you were born to sing his music or he was born <clears throat> to feed you music because there, there is a unity, the way he creates um, for the voice that just fits you perfectly. Thank you, Robert, for that, because I couldn't agree more. There are three composers that I feel are actually, I was born to perform their music. They are Samuel Barber, Giuseppe Verdi, 
and the rest raus. Not bad company. Not too bad, <laughs> yes. Do you remember what else was on the program of that town hall recital? One of the most esoteric programs on the face of God's green earth. As a neophyte performer, I haven't a clue how I got the nerve to do it. It included a fabulous group of Manuel Rosenthal, who was just with the bravura success this year at the Metropolitan. Um, Handel, which I still, Baroque music in the first half. A very esoteric group of Mahler things in very Southern German. <laughs> uh, Negro spirituals and Samuel Barber's Hermit songs. That was very ambitious. Very frou frou. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> very frou frou. How did it come off? Not too bad. <laughs> Not too bad. <laughs> Not too bad. <laughs> and of course, that has led to a remarkable recital career. I don't think there's ever been a year that you haven't sung recital somewhere in the world? No, I think that if you have um, a nuance, I think that you can be something of a recitalist. There are opera singers who like that medium and there are those who are absolutely petrified of it. I happen to be one who likes as much to do 19 characters in one evening, um, stripped from the, the mise-en-scene and also the props of costumes and orchestra as much as I do the opposite. I like very much the medium of recitals as much as I love opera. Yeah. It's actually even more creative because as you say you're <clears throat> dealing with so many personalities and styles and words in an evening that you have to be really up for a, a whole recital and uh, that's true. on top of it. Uh, also, uh, Robert, I think it is very good for an operatic career because I do, I do really think au contraire to the opinion of some of my colleagues that they think that the voice has to go inside and you have to be, have a tighter approach to recital. I don't agree with it at all. I think it is as, 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 as grandiose as opera with your own personality painting the colors instead of it solved for you by other, by, by other uh, a medium, you know, of the, of the lighting and the stage and the colleagues, etc. But it is very good for keeping the voice fresh. It is very good for getting a feeling of pacing. And it is of great use when you come back into this, the, 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 the almost overwhelming form of opera. I found it very, very useful for, for improving operatic performance as a man. And if you have a big, vibrant voice like yours, it'd be a pity to swallow it all inside and sing small scale. I mean, you, you, you sing as you are. Yes, because it, 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 that's my mental attitude. I, singing is singing. I mean, why should you do one, you know, uh, um, I've never considered a sort of a precieuse way of expressing no. yourself. I, au contraire, I think it's something that you bring the inner out, you know. Before we uh, leave uh, Samuel Barber, I would like to have a few recollections of him, I mean, some of the things you remember about him the most, because he certainly has been one of America's great composers, and we do miss him at this juncture. Oh, indeed. Um, well, I think I'm a very fortunate artist, because I had a composer who wrote an opera around my particular vocal apparatus, and I remain true to that music, because I think that that opera is a very important opera, and it was composed for the most important cultural event of the century, the opening of the New Metropolitan Opera. I consider myself very fortunate to have had the responsibility, and it truly was, to be the protagonista to open this really grandiose ambiance. That it was not for, I think, the composer himself who was and will always be a very successful composer, that the most grandiose event of his life perhaps was not by some considered the greatest success. I think might have been a very devastating experience for him. I think that the event itself, because of its importance, was so overwhelming that perhaps too many things went on at once. But this score I think eventually will be realized in the, in the proper importance that, it, that it, I think that it should have had at this particular occasion, which is historic in its importance. And I have done my bit, I think, because he wrote 
a concert version of the kernel of the, of the music of Cleopatra, which is unsurpassable in its pure and magnificent beauty, which I have performed with great success all over the world, as recently as three seasons ago with Maestro Zubin Mehta and the New York Philharmonic, at which Mr. Barber, I'm happy to say, was present to hear the great scene, I think, The Death of Cleopatra, which actually, even that evening, was considered the most beautiful music that many people had heard, including the major critics. They, they could not deny that that was beautiful music. The opera, by the way, is Antony and Cleopatra. Which Antony we have, and we Cleopatra. I think I said <coughs> something, did I? Mentioned, but it, it, it was, I think, uh, having known Sam a little bit, a devastating event because, he, as you say, he was such a successful composer with everything he ever put his pen to. The Midas touch, yes. absolutely. And I think that there's something about winning and success if one gets, you know, if you are a person who seems to, to have that quality, you may, you can be devastated if something that you are almost sure, you know, this is, this is the greater effort, shall we say, of your entire life, of your entire career might not have gone as you wished it, wished it had. It could be very devastating. Because in the period afterwards, he, his composition trailed off. He, he, I think he began to withdraw a little bit from composing. Well, I think as a, as a person, he became a bit of a recluse. Mm -hmm. But uh, as a composer, I don't think the tempo and the pace of, his, of, his, uh, of the way he composed was any different because he was not necessarily the most pr prolific composer. But the substance and the quality of what he composed is what made everything a success when he did finish it, you see. And being that type of performer myself, I can relate to that, you know. <laughs> when he wrote for you, did he ever ask you, would you like this, would you like this high note, would, uh, what would you suggest here, or did he just write and then give it to you? Well, we were, were such dear friends that he would come to the house. I mean, I would get, when, before the ink was dry, each page from a new composition or, or for Anthony and Cleopatra. That's why I think even for the early rehearsals, there was less chaos. I was, I knew everything cold because I had this friendship and I was given the music, I think, probably earlier. The, 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 the character of Cleopatra with her music was a compact unit and it had been um, loved and nurtured by the composer and the performer in the ambiance of my little home <laughs> so that it was all thought out and loved before I even came to the Metropolitan Rehearsals. And I think that is why that is the music that, is, that was considered, you know, and I think it is the strongest in the whole score. Yeah, it was like fitting a dress to absolutely, your body. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Now we're talking about opera, and I want to go back because I think that one of the great chapters, interesting chapters in your early opera career was the NBC opera days. Yes. Because yes. you did uh, Tosca in 1955. You had <clears throat> national exposure at a time when you were just beginning to grow as a national artist. Uh, yes. What are your remembrances of those NBC days? I remember a very beloved friend, too. Uh, Samuel Shatsanoff, whom I adored, Peter Herman Adler, whom I adored and still adore, uh, taking a chance on this, uh, you know, rare and to go lyric soprano from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, when, uh, when I was chosen for Tosca, I remember an awful lot of strange negative rumblings and a lot of noise, which I, in retrospect, uh, didn't understand until some time later. Um, this, shall we say, progressive move of NBC and Samuel, Sh Samuel Shatsanoff, who at that time was running the NBC theater, um, decided that they wanted to take a chance. It was a barrier breaking time for me, uh, which seems later on to have been the story of my life, and happily, I love that responsibility. It, it still is, it keeps, keeps me on my tippies. I like that kind of, I like challenges. If that had to be one, then fine. But it was the first time that a black artist had been on a, in a major operatic role on a, a, a national television. So there was a lot of rumpus and rumbling about it. But uh, happily, it certainly didn't interfere at all with the performance because my excitement was exactly the opposite. My excitement was to have this major exposure in a role that I loved and to be able to to really express myself, and that's the, that's the way it worked out. It was a great success, and the beginning of many appearances with this, which I consider one of my home opera companies, yes. before, before actually getting on the grand opera stage. 
And it must 1955, have been, I think it was, yes. yes. It must have been interesting for you as an actress because, of course, on television you act in a very subtle way because the camera is on top of you. Yes. And it must have helped you think about many things you were doing as a, as a young opera actress. Yes, as a matter of fact, that type of, that type of experience was very good for a recording career, which is very subtle. One paints uh, through the microphone with the vocal colors to, 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 shall we say, to focus a character. Also, one has to do with your eyes and your facial expressions on television, uh, where one can do large gestures on, a, on the grand opera stage. It's that type of um, shifting of gears, which, um, which, which makes it a different, slightly different medium. But um, in those days, I, I, the thing that thrills me now is that the audio has been so improved, you know, they were just beginning in those days, that, that, that one can also sing in the same normal, you know, the same way that you would in, in, a, in, a, in a great theater. This, this has encouraged me a great deal but about television. But then you television. couldn't. Then you could, but that was, they, they was the audio was still not quite as, um, as, uh, as, as good as it is now, you know. And just for the record, as I recall, there's the magic flute. Yes, there is with the great Georges Baranchine as the director. Ah, oh, what an experience that was. And W.H. Auden, who did the libretto, incredible company. Then there was the Les Dialogues des Carmelites, which was um, the, really the year of technically in San Francisco of my grand opera debut. And ha having done it there, I did it also at the NBC on the, on the television um, of Francis Poulain. Yes, and you did Madame Lidouan, the, uh, the, the new prioress. C'est compris, yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And there was also uh, Don Giovanni with C Don Giovanni with Chase of the Sea, the one and only. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, Don Giovanni. So that was an amazing, in those few and years, an amazing exposure for you to an audience across the country. It was what I call the Midas Touch era of my mm. career. Everything, everything came from all four corners that were positive things for me. And to sound a tiny bit arrogant, I really... Uh, I'm proud that I was ready for each occasion. I mean, I really was was up to the up to the moment when it was none of the none of the space all the time or energy was wasted. And it wasn't easy because these operas, I recall, were all done in English, and of course, you probably were learning them in the original language as well. That's correct, um, but without too much difficulty because that's that that was that was good because particularly for Don Giovanni for Tosca, uh, those were some of the mainstays of my repertoire during my early years at the Metropolitan. My first season I did something like five roles because they'd all been tried out in various areas, you know, and so I was really ready. And do them the way they and were do them supposed the way I to could be done. Do them, yes. <laughs> you mentioned 1957 was your San Francisco opera debut yes. and it was the Dialogue of the Carmelites. What do you recall about that occasion? Well, I recall um, the beginning also of a very Precious, very interesting friendship with um, Maestro Kurt Herbert Adler, who is um, the uh, director of the San Francisco Opera Company. It was my first time on that kind of a big stage, and uh, I kept coming on a rolling stage that was done, a revolving stage. I was always on either the opposite end of it, or I was too late getting on it. It was a very confusing time for me. But uh, once I, 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 my, my theory on anything is to just keep singing as it was the opening night of heaven. Don't miss a beat and whatever else is wrong will, will fall into place. Also, a great artist, La Stella, had an emergency appendectomy. And um, that was the beginning of my um, grand expression of what I call the Ethiopian bit. Dear darling Aida, because I was asked to to take over the part of Aida immediately, and I was ready to do so. So that was the beginning of that particular season of a really important role in my life. Plunging right in with Plunging both feet. Plunging right in with both feet, <laughs> but not one ounce of nerve. Not one. It's the one thing about the 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 early experience and youth, of course, as I say. Not the least bit frightened, just ready to go on, you know, as much as I possibly could, had you as been soon as possible. Had you been studying Aida at that point? Is that how, I mean, you just were yes. getting it into the Absolutely. repertory. Apropos to that, Peter Herman Adler took me to the home 
Villa Pace to one of the greatest artists of our time, whom I admire and always will, and that is La Rosa Poncel. And that afternoon was a very important one in my life because she went through the score of Aida with me. I sang Aida and she sang Amneris. We ended up giggling. We ended up, it was one of the most extraordinary experiences I have ever had to be in the presence of, of that type of natural greatness, shall we say, and to have her say that I had potential. That was one of the first readings through the score that I had along those lines. And then I learned the score, of course, mm -hmm. technically. So I was really ready for it when it, was time, when it was time to do it there. I have never studied an acting plan, shall we say, had an acting plan for Aida. She always came out of my own feelings. And I think probably that's one of the reasons she remained uh, became rather one of the most important roles for me in my career. It's just natural expression. I never had anyone sense. sort of choreograph it for me. I always, that once that I did, it was not a success for me personally. It was not a success for me. And I gave that up. I accepted someone else's ideas of an organization of the feelings of Aida, who still is me. Whatever I am at the moment, I can make her that. She has been my warrior role. She has been my spokeswoman. She has been uh, an expression of 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 uh, a turmoil, um, of of uh, of of liberation, of uh, expression of emotion for my people, for me as an American. It has been everything I can possibly think of, and I re recently recorded it with. Um, Maestro Meta and the Israel Philharmonic. And this is what is so extraordinary. Something even about the ambiance of Israel in a strange way, which co sort of collaborated at this stage in my life, something, of time, something even extra came into, into this interpretation of the Aries that I did then, which I never expected that I would. Uh, I really thought I had tapped her, her totally as a character. And it's very encouraging because I, I had taken her out of, out of my repertoire because I, I want to do things like I would like to, to, to maintain a philosophy that my mother had for buon gusto, for good manners, when visiting or having meals out, is to always leave a little dessert on the plate, even though you are sure that the last bite will probably be the best. I think I might over, have overdone it, but. It was wonderful, even in concert form to f and recording form, to find that there would still be something left that I could find in Aida. Some other know? color to some it, some other, other dimension, dimension mm. of her. It's because you, I think it was around 1972, you vowed not to sing it again, and you stopped. That, no, 76, wasn't it? Yeah, well, then you came back to the Met and did it that one. I never vowed season. before oh, then. Oh, you didn't? Oh, okay. no, 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 no. 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 Yeah, but then you've taken it out uh, of the repertory since. Ah, uh, that's what I say. I, since this summer, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, 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 have a, I don't know. I was very encouraged when I found that there was a lot more left in her. Yes. When you mention Rosa Poncel, I think you make a very interesting connection in the history of American singing because of the two of you, you share a good deal of repertory, Mozart, Verdi. Yes. And I've always felt you know, that there is that extension from the Poncel tradition now to the, to the Price tradition. Was she an idol of yours? Was she somebody you... She too, yes, exactly. Uh, you yes. knew her records and... and I, I, uh, uh, apropos La Milanoff, I knew much more about Poncel in that particular uh, time of my life than I did uh, the other great artists. Yes. They both are really columns. But it must have been a thrill to go to Poncel and work on something like it. Like it was only one afternoon. Just I just went for, for tea just with, the, uh, uh, with Peter Hermanelli as a friend because they were very devoted to each other for such a long, long time. And it was one of those sparks of light in a young singer's life that you never forget, you know, like the first performance of Anderson. Yes. And so, so those things you remember. Now, something very interesting, you were really going gangbusters here in this country. Things were happening. You were in San Francisco. You were headed for Chicago. But you did go off to Europe, and you made a tremendous career in Vienna and Milan and all the great opera houses. Did you feel it was necessary to go to Europe to sort of get that final 
touch, that final acceptance, and then come back to this country? Robert, it wasn't so much that it was necessary, no, because already I had been, I had had quite a bit of major exposure uh, as an American artist. But the opportunity was there. And that opportunity was, uh, speaking of another distinct type of chemistry, I've had wonderful friends in my life in the musical area. Uh, these friendships have helped me to build whatever kind of artist I am, and I hope that's a good one. As far as the European balance of this career, this opportunity was afforded me through Andre Mertens by auditioning for Herbert von Karajan one day in Carnegie Hall. He came up on stage, waved the pianist away, played the aria for me. We, too, became very good friends. He was about to take over the Wienstaatsoper at that time as the musical administrator and invited me to come to perform the Zauberflüte and Aida's. And from then on, under his baton for about seven seasons, major things happened to me in Europe, which I think is responsible for the European exposure of the career, which makes a career an international career. So with the major festivals, like the Salzburg Festival, and a few other performances at the Musikverein and all of the performances of those years, very important ones in the Wien Staatsoper, I was able to get experience, which really, I think, prepared me in the best possible professional form to accept the invitation of Sir Rudolf Brink to become a member of the Metropolitan Opera because I had my roles tried out with professional performers like Giulietta Simonata, uh, Giuseppe Di Stefano. In other words, I was no longer a neophyte. I really had become a professional, uh, uh, be on my way to becoming a professional artist, which is needed when a youngster comes. Not too young, but I mean uh, young for, to begin a major career in the major opera house of the world, the Metropolitan. And I think that that is what made, I was very prepared when I, when I made my debut with the Metropolitan. So you, were all, <clears throat> you were also going to places where these operas were born, where, exactly. the, where the tradition... And uh, that rubs off. Also, it is, it is, it is, it is an air that, that one keeps. Is, it's like the roots from Laurel, you know. Um, if you have the potential, these opportunities you use for what's to come after, for the real, as, as we say, the real heavy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and as I tell youngsters now, you know, Try your best, and I did. Try your best always for the major opera houses, please. From the studio to the stage of a major opera house, there are 10 dimensions at least. And even then, something could go wrong. <laughs> but do your best to try to have such a strong, such a strong professional um, bulwark that the best of you can be seen without anything wavering in that major exposure. And fortunately, that's what happened to me in 1961. Yeah, and I think that's why I was able to build, to become an important member of, of the Metropolitan Opera Association. Leontine, like many smart singers, you saved your Metropolitan Opera debut to be a climactic moment. Everything built up to that, your expo exposure around the country, going to Europe and so on. Can we relive a little bit that night in 1961 because it was a historic night. You got an awful lot of applause. I do often. That night <laughs> is so important in my life still, Robert. On, uh, I, uh, if, I, if I ever have these moments that I don't feel too well, there are certain wonderful things I do, like reading wonderful letters or critiques from uh, dear friends, <clears throat> but nothing like um, a tape of the applause of my Metropolitan <laughs> Opera debut. And it's true, it was really exactly 42 minutes. That's not a joke, absolutely, because I had members of my family at that time <laughs> did. I cannot tell you, I think, and I tell young artists now, that is an achievement. That is historic. There's no denying it. There's only the enjoyment of it. It is like climbing a very special mountain and looking out over things from the absolute top of it. I don't think it's too understood when you, when, you, when you might want to do another one after that. But that particular one is a height that is practically indescribable. And that's why I cannot accent to them more 
that the view is even better if you are prepared when you climb that mountain to get to the, if you are if you really believe that that height had a, had a, had a had a special meaning to you to get to it and you must be prepared to get to it that is that's what makes it the Hallowood Hall you see it is something that you can remember the rest of your life as an extremely positive experience. Was coming to the Met sort of like coming to the Holy Shrine? Was that the ultimate for you well, as an it's American? Well, Shangri-La, I call it. <laughs> it's like this uh, being born and, 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 and living all the other years in between <laughs> just think of the Metropolitan. That's true. It may sound a little juvenile, but it's, 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 it's that, it was that pristine in my, in my, and, and, um, pristine and fervent in my whole uh, uh, um, uh, attitude to achieve this goal. And um, I've been very fortunate because I've, I've been able to climb some mountains after that, but none, none with the excitement of that particular one. Was it nerve-wracking? I know you were speaking that other debuts had not been that nerve-wracking. By 1961, were you terrified about finally coming to the Met? Did you I actually didn't have one single nerve the night of my debut. It was such a glorious experience, and I really was so, maybe this is, this, this is uh, exemplary of this strange ego I have. I think all people with quiet egos are very dangerous. <laughs> uh, the ones with the volatile ones, at least you know where you stand. I, I was so happy that night and so full of myself and so full of the occasion that I, I simply, I do remember making a statement which I think is some cocktail conversation through the years. I said, well, I said, look, Jesus, you got me into this. Now it's up to you. You get me out because I'm <laughs> going out of the wings and do the best I can. <laughs> uh, it worked. I think the, what does one do after that? You have to try to maintain a certain type of standard. I think some of the mountains after that are the ones that have been the most nerve wracking. That one was not. Maybe it was because it was sheer happiness. Yes. And it was a major event. You had <clears throat> Corelli was making his debut that night too. I think we forgot to mention it's a double yes, debut. It was, it was, it was, um, it was um, two lions in the arena. Because <laughs> 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 I think of opera as this Christians in the lion sometimes, or you know, I, I sort of the um, blood and sand syndrome, uh, which is rather um, a good way to think of it, you know, um, or a baseball game. You must be at your best when your time comes up to bat. It was a thrilling evening, let's face it. Did you feel you had to prove something when you got out there? Uh... Oh, Robert, I think I feel that all my life. I think I did, yes. I thought I, th I think, as I always do, I, I, maybe I'm not as, I don't luxurate in the feeling that probably it is, it is not quite as, as um, shall we say, as, uh, let, yes. I will always feel that I, I, I like coming out of the wings knowing that I have to prove something. I like, I like coming out of the wings knowing that I, that I have something to say for more than myself, for more than just my own personal. Um, I, that's kept me alive. Uh, I don't want to come off as sort of a, a chocolate Joan of Arc, <laughs> but uh, I, that's really the way I feel about it. To make a statement, to um, break tradition, to, to Make us to make a a, a focus about uh, me as an American to make a statement about um, acceptance or non-acceptance to 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 break a barrier. This it's just like it's it's uh, it keeps you on your tippies. It keeps you really you know very vibrant. I don't think I'll ever be without that. And if you have something that you think you're proving. And in my case, I think I did. I think I did have something to prove. Um, I had a legacy left to me, I think, by a very great lady. And it behooved me to extend it. The great lady was Marian Anderson. It behooved me to extend it. Because if I could think for one instant that I had one youngster later, when God sees fit or circumstances or, or age or whatever or lack of the certain standards to maintain that I'll have to to draw back and, I, and I'll be I want to have the right mental attitude about it I want to believe that I really left a standard and, and, a, and, a, and a quality hopefully of inspiration for those after me as I had. So it was Marian Anderson who really had that it was your torch in the, in the background. There you are and uh, 
I like to feel time by time that maybe I didn't let her down, you know? Because 1961 was still a very um, rocky period and you were breaking a lot of ground. My undergraduate career, strangely enough, was parallel with the, the um, main focus of civil rights in America. It's a strange thing that. That is also the way I eat it was for me, you know, it was, it was my, it was my, as I said, my warrior part, my, my statement part. Um, there are so many things in the libretto, particularly the turmoil of Aida with her father. It was it also the nobility of Aida, which made her a column of expression for me, for, for me as a, back, as a black American, that, that was almost in the poles of, of, of making a statement at this particular time with a career that was totally parallel with, uh, with, with, with civil rights. And the thing that I think is so super about being an American about America is the difficulty is to for us to uh, live through any embryonic stage of anything and then it becomes a part of our culture as if it were never there and I think that's our salvation. <clears throat> and and <clears throat> at this point in time it's all become so assimilated one doesn't think 20 years later one doesn't think at all along those same lines. Again. No and that's what makes me so um, happy is because you know it's one thing to sort of have to come up to bat to prove something and then you get it behind you and then you, you just come to bat because of the, for the joy of, of, of doing it. That's where I am now. And that's, that's what I think uh, is, is, is this, this sort of different sound um, vocally for me, which has come at, um, at perhaps, perhaps a mature part of the career where usually it's exactly the other way around. But something, that, something about crises and responsibilities and challenges, that if you grow with it, the tide, you know, it's like being a box or anything else. Uh, your, your mature years can be pretty, pretty full too. It depends on your, your attitude, also in the case of singers that care for the instrument. In my particular case, it has worked. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your relationship with Rudolph Bing, because it was he who brought you to the Met. Was it a good working relationship? Yes. As a matter of fact, I consider him a very dear friend. Um, one of the wittiest, uh, most devious, most difficult, most elegant people I've ever met, who was a staunch captain of the helm, who had this incredible attitude, which, I mean, the Met really is hallowed. He had the, the flair for that uh, position that I think was unique. He had the substance of uh, accepting decisions, the responsibility of that position, with, with a type of naturalness and, and strength, I think, that, uh, let's face it, for whatever reason or not, whether it would have been inevitable or not, the timing on things is also important. He had the know-how and the courage, maybe in some senses if you can think of it, to have black American artists in the Metropolitan. So whether it would have been inevitable or not, he is the person that made the invitation. So it makes him also unique in that way. Yes, and he didn't stop because he kept Definitely feeding not. them into the exactly. Uh, and no, what, Lisa, wouldn't it be a shame? I mean, we're, we, you know, uh, uh, art. What does art have to do with anything except uh, substance? And it's sort of ridiculous. We are the seat of, of democracy. It doesn't make, it's, it's kind of ridiculous not to have the best artists existing in the best opera house. And I, I, I think he's pretty special for that. I like, I like, I like the idea uh, that we even sometimes also uh, talk about that. But he was truly, his whole attitude about the ambiance of that position was one I thought was extremely bravoure and very, uh, and very apropos to what, what was going on inside, you know. And did you feel that he was looking after you as an artist as well, doing things that were the best for you in the theater? Well, it's like uh, being the head of General Motors or something <laughs> like that, you know. Uh, as long, uh, how can I put it? Um, it's like a garland of your own little personal flower, shall we say, <laughs> or a, a bouquet. You know, it's, 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 there's, a, there's individual attention given, but with, with an understanding that uh, the captain of the helm is the captain of the helm. It's sort of like, um, you know, 
the distinct family unit, shall we say, <laughs> as it used to be in the good old days. <laughs> um, I would say fairly good individual attention was given, yes, I do. And you I think the artists had, uh, had a great deal of elasticity there. I do, yes. We, along the way, we've talked about a number of people who have been influential, and I, I want to go to some of them specifically. Your teacher, uh, Florence Page Kimball, yes. who you came to at the Juilliard, I know uh, until uh, she died was an enormous force in your life. Oh, yes, indeed. Um, I think the knowledge and the breadth of know-how that I received from Ms. Kimball is the quality of, um, is the focus I'd like to have for youngsters in the very near future to pass on. For her, being a teacher was not being a teacher. For her, f for us, she was a confidant. She was a parent. She was a big sister. She was uh, a technician. She was a critic. She was a lot of things rolled into one. She was able to do that because I don't think she was an, a mass production um, teacher in that way. That's the kind of teacher I would like to be. Uh, and I am, from a big sister point of view these days, for a lot of young artists. I would like very much when I go into this medium, which I will, hopefully that it will work and I will be as good at it as she was, to be that to the, to the, to the youngsters that I would take under my wing. First, they're going to work like mad, which she, which she made us do. But beginning from the time that you want to decide to be an artist, all of the things difficult and facile that are, that, are, that, are, that are to be taken into consideration to be the best artist possible, they, 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 they must get that early, you know. From, in other words, the, 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 the showtime is from the time you come from the wings, not from when you come into the theater. How you are, how you walk, how you express, how you, the singing is a part of it, but all of the other elements, decorative, uh, around it are very important too that I'd like to let, to, to pass on to kids. And you she know? was instrumental she in that was as well. She was very much instrumental. I also had a, 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 a saint, I think he was, <clears throat> Otto Gut in my life as my operatic coach. Uh, who, who left me things that, uh, that, uh, that, are, that, that are reasons that I, I, I really don't even, it's kind of vibrations and kind of knowledge and kind of know-how and kind of friendship and quality of human being that, um, that make me fairly independent now um, for doing certain things with scores that I, that, I, that I can continue to do, you know. He gave me a, a great deal of independence, as they both did. They were very important in my life, still are. What about <clears throat> technically, what can, is there a way of describing the technique that she gave you as a singer? Yes, the philosophy that she gave can be put into one sentence. Uh, two, never forget, as it is in the world, and I think it should be very important vocally, uh, without a nuance, life is very, very dull. <laughs> also, she used to say, Please try to sing on your interest, not your capital. And I do think that that philosophy, which I learned, is perhaps the secret of a certain type of longevity that I'm enjoying. Uh, I would say that a non-compromising attitude about your work, in other words, her theory too is mine is, probably inherited, maybe not, I think it was innate as well, is to be in all work person, if you, if you, if you are, if you, you know, words, the performances, the quality of performances, the art itself should always have the priorities or else you're not, you're going to want to be a certain type of artist. That doesn't mean that you, that you don't have various uh, um, parts of you that are, that are developed as well. But to be a true professional and the best artist possible, that should always come first. And that she imparted to you. And as far as vocal technique, was it something totally different from the way you had sung earlier? I think it would, is as close to the, my teacher studied with Sembrich, which I think is the, uh, a, a bel canto focus. Uh, it is a very relaxed way of singing. It's a very uh, open throated way of singing. In other words, it's, a, it's an outward uh, delivery of the vocal um, instrument. 
I can get even, I think I, I can get even high, more hyper technical about it with, with uh, students. A good, uh, a good um, support from the diaphragm with certain exercises, breathing exercises that develop it. Uh, the, uh, certain areas in the physical um, aspect that make for the best type of tones. But the general philosophy is the ease with which one produces the tones, which I think is very good. One always heard that, that she always Never said let it look difficult, even though it may be. To make it look easy. Yes. The, the, she would tell her students to throw open the windows or yes. in this. Yes, there were always these little, these little diagrams uh, mentally that she gave you to, to, to these little mental pictures that, that really help a great deal. And do they stay in your mind oh, to this day? Oh, are you serious? I wouldn't go on stage if I didn't have them. One of them is, if I don't vocalize to an F in the shower, which, which are vocal leases that, that are given me, particularly for the overtone, not up to a high C, but tones above it, then the chances of you making a crystal clear one that evening are about 95%. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the little tiny theories, you know. The things yes. that really uh, stay with you as a, oh, as a foundation. Absolutely. In other words, don't go into the theater without your whole bag of marbles. That's really <laughs> what I'm trying to say. <laughs> what about Marian Anderson? Of course, she was a great symbol as, as a black singer, but as an artist, when did you first hear Marian Anderson? When I was nine years old in Jackson, Mississippi, my mother took me by bus to have this great experience, which certainly, certainly was the, one of the most important in my life. And when she came from the wings with the regal regality of any empress I'd ever seen, I just knew that I was going to either have to try to duplicate that or, or just forget about it. it was, I, was, I was smitten, totally. It was an experience that I have visions of. Life is a strange thing also, Robert. For her Mother's Day gift, this past Mother's Day, I gave a telephone call to her. I called her very often. As you know, in 1939, the experience with the DAR, barring her from Constitution Hall, is historic. I have been asked by the DAR for next April to open their convention in Constitution Hall. And that was the, the dearest um, Mother's Day gift I thought I could give her. And by phone, she was so very moved and accepted my invitation to be my guest in the box for next April. I think that's for me, one of the most thrilling things I have ever had happen to me. It is a great gift for me, but to be able to, to, to in some way, to underline to her that I have kept her legacy um, as a shining torch in my life, and to be able to be vibrant enough also to invite one's inspiration to partake of this, it's a thrilling experience for me. I believe yes. in these connections and history. I very think it's strongly. fate. I really do. La Forte, so they Del Destino. Destino. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell me about Herbert von Karajan. Do you feel, as a, among conductors, he may have been the most influential in your singing career? I would say that I had a longer time under his baton for development than any other conductor. Uh, I think it was a productive time for my for my development as a professional and as an, as, a, as, an, as, an, as a finished artist. I've had m many great conductors. I just spent a longer time, uh, more years as in consistent performances on a, this particular baton than any others. Also, there's a very strong friendship between us. Um, uh, I, I, have, I, have, I have had such fortunate experiences with great conductors. The year 19, the season 1977, I think I had one of those rare artistic badminton games that are not afforded to lyric sopranos, <laughs> if any instrumentalists, in their whole lifetime. I did shuttle artistic work between the Chicago Symphony and Sir Gerhard Schulte and the Berlin Philharmonic and Herbert von Karajan for one entire season. To date, I don't remember ever being that deliriously happy. It was the most difficult work I'd ever done in my life, but to be with these two conductors back to back for the important performances of my season is one of the happiest experiences I've ever had. And you gotta look a long while to find two, two bands. That are <laughs> <involved>. <laughs> 
Also, in my recent years, I've had, I think, the extension of a very young friendship, which began when uh, Zubin Mehta, Maestro Mehta, was in the chorus of one of the new performances, along with Maestro Abada, in uh, Vienna, studying, conducting, for one of the first Verdi Requiems that I sang with Karyan. And now that he is at the helm of the great New York Philharmonic, this has been a wonderful extension of a friendship which, 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 is, which, which began, good Lord, to tw uh, approximately the same time that, that the friendship began and the performances with Karyan in Wien. And this has been a great joy in my life and is a great joy in my life because the, these, these vibes are, you know, they say, the it, right it's, like, it's like chemistry. I've had, um, recently I had a wonderful experience because I did a, a performance of, um, of a composition that I, I really could or could not do, which was very, very thrilling. And that was with James Levan and the Philadelphia Orchestra for a benefit, pension fund concert, I think it was, um, The Last Scene of Salome, which I would never do on stage. But it was a it was a it was a ball game. I mean, it was really <laughs> there are isolated experiences like that that I remember as moments where you know you're really batting a thousand <laughs> yourself, and you're in a company where everybody's batting a thousand, and they are they are rather in their own way vignettes of history. You know, historic and very vital um, vital moments. My invitation by um, Maestro Mater to perform for the 30th anniversary in Israel is something that, that really is, 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 has been in his very emotional and very strong experience in my life, which I would be grateful to him forever for. Don't you find, like many other artists, that working in the best of situations makes you only better, that it's hard to haul the thing along by yourself? Oh, I love that, Robert. I like it when it's a tight, tight show, you know. I like, I like, I like the heavy armor <laughs> movement. <laughs> I do do my best on that. I can't. Uh, when things are a little mediocre, I I don't I don't I don't I don't exhilarate, shall we say? I like the tougher it is, the better I like it. Um, another wonderful conductor, uh, Erich Leinsdorf, whose early years and some of the best recordings I have were done with him, with RCA. Um, actually, I think in my own way, this is my opinion probably is indirectly responsible, if not directly in some ways, for my first uh, attention brought to me for RCA, because I did the Dialogues of Carmelites with him at the premiere performance in San Francisco in the years that he was there all the time when I first made my debut there. And we've maintained a friendship too through the year. So you felt that he had brought you in, in some I, way I, to I RCA. just have this feeling that it was he who has never been proven to me, but I do, do believe that it was his attention that, uh, that began the RCA interest as you know, a recording artist. All these gentlemen that you mention are, I think, great. Pretty heavy. Pretty heavy. <laughs> and they're great. In the vernacular, <laughs> as my nephew says, yes. <laughs> and they're great singers, conductors. Oh, now, what, what, very makes, vocal, what yes. makes a conductor a really good singer's conductor? I think, and also if you, will, if you will allow me to say, they all have extraordinary egos. I think the greater conductor is the more impossible he should be. <laughs> I like that feeling of, you know, if you, if you have power, you know, it's like a, if you've got it flaunted there, you know, the commercial. And the egos, if they are that extraordinarily impossible, are so grandiose that they will envelop. They want everything to be so great, you know, because they already know they're so great, and they are, that they are never too tired or too inconsiderate to look down their nose at the poor little singers, you know. Au contraire, the vocal conductor is the one that takes the time with a singer. That's, a, that's to, to take the time for a singer to deliver their product with the greatest ease. That to me is, in a nutshell, what makes a, the, the quality that makes a great vocal conductor. And every one of these will do that. What about breathing with you? They that's feel, exactly, they feel what, that's you? exactly yeah. what I meant. Mm. To make the singer as comfortable as possible. In other words, they will even, the egos are so fabulous, don't get me wrong. I'm talking, it's, it all, it's all in the master plan, shall we say. <laughs> Never. And, the, and what makes a singer also, I think, um, 
very good with conductors is never bring them someone else's tempi into the room. The bright-eyedness and the, the eagerness to do their way will also make them very considerate of you because they see that you are pliable, they will be pliable. If they feel that you are rigid, you're finished. You're finished because they can tell it immediately, especially the ones with the egos that I'm talking about, the ones that worth having it. <laughs> and it, what they demand from me, they can have. It, it, the best I've got, they can get. They, I, from these people, there's nothing they tell me I can do that I, that I can't do. I've done things with these conductors that I didn't know I could do. Because they stretch I record them. things with these conductors I didn't know I would do. They say do it. I mean, in December, um, Sir Gerhawk said, doing a performance of the Verdi Requiem in, um, in um, Albert Hall, which was a benefit performance. Uh, Leontine, would you, would you mind looking over um, two arias of Wagner, a composer that I have not even uh, looked at? And because, you know, I, I always face C City Hall in the beginning. I like to be the best flower in the garden that I fit in, you know. <laughs> that way you stand out better than the others. Uh, how about uh, a little vignette from Tristan and Isolde and uh, Edith Tara Harley? And I said, oh, why not? You know, I was exhilarated in the spur of the moment because it was so wonderful. <clears throat> the time came around for April that I was supposed to do this for Yale University Benefit in Carnegie Hall. And I looked in the mirror myself and said, you know what? You are crazy. <laughs> 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 but you have to get on the plane tomorrow. Of course, I learned everything cold. And you are going to face Maestro Schulte. <clears throat> and tell him that you're really going to come in to New York and do this. I had about two minutes that I thought, I, I don't know if you really got your, have your head on right. I came in, he gave the downbeat with the Chicago Symphony, which blows your mind. And I thought, you know, of course I am. It was that simple because it, it was the occasion and the, and the, and the quality of the, of, the, of, the, of the artist that you're with. I love that. And the, that fusion that you want to Absolutely. One, one I mean, you just do the best you can. What happens, let's say you're doing the Verdi Requiem with three different conductors and they each have their own concept of mm -hmm. it. Are you pliable or do they... Entirely. Entirely. I must have done it. Uh, I've, done, I've done it the, w w with Carion the way he wants it. I've done it with Shoulder, which is a co co totally con different, different experience. I'm doing it this year with, with, with Levine. Whatever they want, they get. Already, you see, I, I, I already respect, so I mean, I... I, I uh, I have this uh, hero thing, you know, and and already the, I'm already yours. I mean, you you name it, you've got it. You're open unless it's a totally bizarre idea, or something that. But is, they are is not wrong. the people who would have. No, it they, they wouldn't have it. No. That's no. what I mean. You it's pick your company first. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be bizarre, no, because all of them are so. That gets into what I'm meaning about. I guess more than the ego, I mean, uh, um, um, the desire for perfection, which is not too bad. You can aspire to it, you know. It's not to have it at all, that idea at all. It's a little uh, tragic, I think, sometimes in some of our artistic um, uh, ambiances. Uh, it wouldn't be bizarre because it would, it would be within the realm of what is, is written and also what is expected from the composer with their own individuality. And that's what art is, isn't it? Yes, and they're great musicians, so they wouldn't that, attempt anything that wasn't that was, what Verdi you know, or totally Mozart wanted. totally out of uh, sync with reality. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about your voice because uh, you've been oh, singing. I <laughs> we, we know you love your voice, <laughs> but it's, you've been singing a good long time. Yes. How would you describe its development uh, over, the, let's say, the last twenty years? Well, I still think, Robert, that I'm a lyric soprano. The kernel of my voice is a lyric sound. It has dramatic tendencies depending on where it is placed in what repertoire. It can give or take. It has grown in breath. I don't like to use the word power because then it does get to sounding as if I think I'm a dramatic. It has grown for a lyric to have at least three more dimensions and three more focuses to it. I have been blessed with a voice that is <clears throat> even to me, breathtakingly beautiful. <clears throat> uh, that's total immodesty. I do not apologize for that. I don't know of anything, not even myself, that I love more than my sound. It makes me 
It gives me goose pimples when it's at its best. I think that there are things that I do with it now that express even more in a lyric fashion, more professionally, more beautifully, uh, because I have used the year's experiences, negative and positively, to, uh, to produce it in its best form. The care I give it is, is uh, sometimes I don't believe it. I mean, it, is, it, is, it, it gets special, special care. What, what is the care? <clears throat> I never perform unless I am totally en place and in form. I do not get behind in my rest. I do not do anything that will keep it from being in its best form. Do you sing every day as a habit? As a habit, I do something technical every day, yes. I do not, for instance, I don't, I, they, they, I, I, I exercise, I watch what I eat, even better than I used to before. Pressure is another thing, you know, when you are building a career. Pressure can do a lot of things to keep you out of the best health form because it's like in any business, uh, it, you know, if you're, uh, you're constantly running a race, uh, it tells itself. Uh, my whole attitude is one, uh, I think I know more uh, whom I, who I am, which, which certainly expresses itself in the voice. Uh, I've had a lot of things that have come into focus uh, in my life that I'm at great peace with. Um, I feel younger than ever. I feel that I'm on the, on the uh, threshold of a new dimension in my life, which may or may not be totally vocally. I'm prepared for that. I just think it's uh, my voice. My voice is me. What can <laughs> I say? My voice is what I think life is. My voice is, is um, beauty. My voice is America. My voice is my blackness. My voice is my... It's love. My voice is, is, uh, my voice is, is God. I, I hope I'm not, I don't know if I should. No, I think that's, uh, it reveals a lot, that's your it. voice reveals a lot about what you are as a person. It is, it is, it is what, that's, I think that is what makes singing a, a wonderful experience for the listener. It is the most personal instrument given. And it is the best instrument, I think, from an artistic point of view, for that total human contact. What can I say? It's almost intangible in its, in its power to communicate. It's almost indescribable in its force to, 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 to deliver an emotion. I think that's what makes singing such an exciting experience for everyone, don't you think? <clears throat> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's nothing in the way. There's no keyboard. There's no, no wooden box. No. There's just no. those chords. You. And you and, and, and your you expression That's uh, right. with it. It's totally exposed. <laughs> mm. When you're standing in the wings before you go out to sing a concert or an opera, are you preoccupied with the voice or are your thoughts uh, somewhere else? Well, I'm, I'll be honest. I am always very nervous before I sang, particularly since I, uh, the area of the career reached a certain stage. I don't apologize for that because I think it underlines that I'm, I have a certain type of sensitivity. I would adore, I have everything done in order not to be nervous. It never works. I think it's because I'm never sure. And I don't think you should ever be sure in art. I don't think a painter's ever sure that that's the state of blue he wants on that. There's always this, this, this element of improvement. So no matter what you do, I can never be cavalier about it. It could be a combination of things. It could be a combination of that, uh, that added responsibility, that added um, focus of being a barrier breaker. That al always had that extra thought of, will I be able to really make this statement so that it will be a positive one, that it will make impact, or will it have impact. Uh, uh, so I'm always, I wouldn't say apprehensive, because when you know your work, you're not apprehensive, but I'm never sure. 
and uh, and and I don't think I would like to be any different. It's it's a it's a it's a little painful, but uh, it, it goes with the territory. I think. <clears throat> well, it also creates a certain kind of adrenaline in the system too it that does. makes you want to. It's like a race you up. I, I think. Yes. Don't you see them sort of? You know, when they that that moment before the bell starts, that no matter how uh, how fantastic they 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 look as if they look as if they're winners, but there's that moment of, of that they're all doing that little little movement, that little emotional edge. It's, you know, it's, it's not very much different, you it's know. All just no. getting charged up for the. For but the it race. is in the mind. You must think of yourself as a thoroughbred and do the work that it takes to be a thoroughbred. That's also that little straw that breaks the camel's back there sometimes. Which a lot of people don't always have that mm -hmm. feeling about themselves. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> in the. Um, development of your voice, did you ever do things to try to make it bigger or darker no. or wider or whatever? It's no. all natural. I think that's the secret to it. Totally, the, the expansion came from experience, from know-how, and from the use of it uh, on its own. Total natural experience. I think, can you really go against the cause that you have? If you have the right teacher, you will know that when the embryonic stages of development began. And I think that philosophy for the people that were involved with me, like Kimball and Goot, earlier, and Peter Herman Adler, you sort of, it's not that you're categorizing yourself, it's just using what you have to the, to the most, to its, to, its, to, its, to its fullest extent. Um, it also keeps you so busy that you're not concerned about changing what you have. I think developing on, Otherwise, individuality, I think, would be extinct, which would be a tragedy in, 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 in art, don't you think? Absolutely. Uh, develop what you have to the fullest and make it shine the brightest, and, it, and it'll see you through. I never, and don't tinker with, you know, uh, enjoy it the way it is in its natural form. Develop it. Make it have more finesse, but don't change it. That's you. That's what sets you apart. That's what made someone say you are a potential artist so they want you to sing rather than someone else. Why change it? Then you're stripped of the thing that makes you set apart. It's a very sensible attitude which is of course accounts for the fact that you've been singing a good long time. Have there been mistakes along the way? Oh yes. <laughs> I'm happy to say not too many because I, I, um, I like to win so I, I try to learn from experiences. Uh, negative and not repeat them. Earlier in the stages of being a token black, I think in, in this grandiose form, I said yes to things that I had no business saying yes to because I couldn't afford to say, I didn't think I could afford to say no. I'm not sure. I really didn't think I could. The opportunity was there. I had to take the space. So I said yes. I think the evidence of some type of strength in the kind of person that I am makes you survive those particular crises. Yeah. And you do it and then you say, uh, ciao. I, oh, and don't you, be ridiculous, don't, don't do, do that again. again. Don't do it again. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yes, I've made mistakes. Not recently, but <laughs> I did make <laughs> because you've learned a few, indeed. Along, along then you the apply them to, the, to, 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 to cutting down on the chances that it happens again. I remember once you told me in an interview that Verdi and Mozart were the best vocal pals you had because you could be so comfortable with them that you could perform with total abandon. Do you still feel that way? Yes, I do. Um, I think it's the same. It's the same. It's the same type of. They write very similarly. I think um, in the vocal area of my voice that has that that, that has its ease, shall we say? Um, maybe maybe what I mean the column of the voice, the kernel of the voice, yeah, the mm -hmm. center. Some things say yes. Um, because of the various, uh, the, 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 one Mediterranean and the other one uh, 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 Austrian, there are different qualities, of course, in style. But the basic, um, I say, the basic delivery is, is lies very easy for me you know, to express myself. I think the voice, for me, to be the a typical a Mozartian protagonista is not necessarily my sound. And I think that probably is why some of the, Mo the Mozart that I do is a little bit, which is the same instance in Strauss, which is usually approached with, with, with a sort of uh, la frigida um, vocal focus because my voice is a rather um, uh, dark, um, sensual, um, luscious sound. Oh, I do love it, don't <laughs> I? Uh, it, it, it actually, 
is, is, is sort of contradictory in these two literatures, which makes it rather attractive, I've been told. Yes, because we're used to a, a whiter, right, pure Right, right, and, yeah. and, and, and a voice that, because the, the style, the, the way, the style that I sing in um, it fits very well, the literature. But added to it is this is this quality, the uh, natural quality of the color of it, which is, is rather disarming uh, which, sometimes. Which people which, aren't used to hearing always yes, in but this they, music. They, they seem to like it, I'm happy to say, yes. Is Strauss a new love of yours? Because yes. you didn't sing a lot of Strauss for a long time. No, Strauss came into my life uh, at a, the mature stage of my career. About It's been about five years now. In, in recital literature, concert literature, and in operatic literature. What changed your mind? It just fits. Uh -huh. It just fits. It's the same with the other, as, other, as the other three, including Barbara. It fit. Yes. What about Verdi? Are there roles still left in the Verdi literature you'd still I like to do? I really thank Robert that I've run the gamut. I have looked very often at the scores of Macbeth, areas of them I have recorded. The uh, Nabucco I wouldn't touch with the tinfoil pole. Um, um, the early Verdi, aside from Ernani, that's the period that started to fit the, the type of not coloratura, but fioratura that, 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 is, that is evident in my particular vocal approach. The very earlier things I could do, but I don't think, uh, I don't think with, with the facileness mm. that I can do from the period of Ernani down. Oh, right, yes. yes. I know you always want to do Desdemona in Otello, which you have not had the chance to do. Would that still be a possibility? I have not wanted to do that. I have no. been invited to do it, and I would not do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel rather strongly about that. Although I have been a barrier breaker, I am I'm a realistic theater-wise. Theatrically, I tend to try to be a little reali uh, realistic. You know, it, it, there's elasticity in everything. As a matter of fact, this is on the new disc with, with Meta. I've recorded this, Damona, twice. I do not know with the references in the Shakespeare play itself. The plot itself is so hinged on the decorative and the word Bianca is evident in Trovatore, in some areas of Forza, in some of the others. For I'm being maybe hyper-technical, but we're also talking about the visual, aren't we? We're also talking about continuity. And I've been even criticized, something about not, maybe not wanting to take it. But I really, I mean, I, it's like, for instance, Lohengrin. Do you understand sure. my thinking? There are, which is sometimes my hesitation, Ariadne is a different story. Uh, Manon, to, to an extent, is all right, because actually this, is, this has to do with the type of dress of a period which can be solved by a director. You cannot, how can you? Maybe someone can solve the situation. I mean, just the basic problem that the, the, basic, that the, the, problem, that the tenor is black, a uh, 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 black figure, and the wife. Is, not so much that uh, as actually the 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 the, the visualness of Desdemona as the character and as a vision is written in that way. I, maybe I'm wrong. I don't. I see it that way. I could be wrong. I don't really care in that sense. That's my reason for not doing it. And I don't think anyone can probably accuse me if they do. That's their problem, of not not having enough ambition or not having enough uh, get up and go to do. It. Heaven only knows. I've certainly tried it with every other thing. These are just. This is just a role I didn't choose to try it with. I see. I see. Is there a line, a vocal line in Verdi that is absolutely beyond your favorite? Something that do you think is probably the most beautiful thing ever written? Well, the ascending line of a floating legato, weak ergo in the very requiem, is something that I just wait. I just can't wait to do. Would you like, or, to, or would you like to do that yes, right or, now? <laughs> or even the opening Kyrie. Yes, why not? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
say. <laughs> Obviously, as overwhelming as it is to be in the audience of a Leontine Price performance, to sit here and experience is, is a, a thrill for me. And I thank you very much, but I have one question before we close. Yes. A lot of things will be written about Leontine Price on Into Infinity. <laughs> <laughs> what would you, if you had your choice, what would you like people to remember you most for as a singer, as a human being, whatever? As the best I could be having tried to be the best I could be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. It's a joy. Joy for me. Thank you.